In 2016, Amhadas joined Oromos in protesting. It was a time bomb. That's Dr. Asababa Ragasa Debello. So we can say the last three, four years were nationally a period of political instabilities in the country. So people just come up with issues that they had before. In 2015, under the guidance of the Ethiopian Constitution's covenant, the Amara people organized themselves and petitioned the Ethiopian government to have the Wolkai region to rejoin the Amara state. That's Tedros Terfe speaking at a U.S. hearing on democracy in Ethiopia. He is the co-founder of the Amhara Association of America. The response by TPLF was to get, kidnap the officers of the Wolkai Amara Identity Committee in the middle of the night in 2016 and charge them with terrorism. The Wolkai district had been under the Amhara region prior to the current government taking power. It's now part of the Tigray region. A man called uh, Colonel uh, Demeka, he was uh, a member of uh, TPLF. You know, he fought as a combatant under TPLF. But when it comes to the issue of identity, he ended up saying that we are not under Tigray. Uh, we should be under Gondar. He had his own uh, movement. That was Dr. Waldu Wade Yesus, who is from Tigray. They speak Tigrinya, but they cry in Amharic, as they say. They are very much deeply connected to their Amhara heritage. And they ask it that, okay, as per the constitution, right, we, we really want to, to reclaim our Amhara identity. And that would only happen if we go back to be part of the Amhara regional state. That is not something welcomed by the Tigrayan original state. And that's Dr. Johannes Gedamu. He was born in Gondar in the Amhara region. Because they were under the Amhara rule in the last two emperors doesn't make them Amhara. But uh, sometimes identity it doesn't come because you want it. Identity is something which is constructed in the negotiation that is made between people. So these people, if they say that they are Amharas, even if they are Grinya speakers, even if they live in areas which were dominated by Tigrinya speakers, they have to be listened to. They have to be given appropriate response. So the former Tigray government didn't give appropriate response to these people. According to Dr. Wilde Yesus, the Ethiopian constitution grants the Tigray region control over Wolkite, and that's why the federal government couldn't intervene. But some say the conflict isn't just about identity. It was also economically important area for uh, kind of commercial crops production, cultivation. So both regional states have their own interest in that. And it was also part of the outlet to to Sudan, Sibu Matama. Critics say these economic advantages are the real reasons the Tigray region has claimed Welkite. One of the plan of the TPLF has been making a, tig a greater Tigray. That if things come push to shove and they lose power of running the greater Ethiopia, they have always aspired not only uh, finding a way that, that they can connect Tigray to uh, an international political boundary like Sudan. And this region, uh, Folkai Tagere, uh, extend itself all the way to the border of Sudan. So by them forcefully annexing it, not only do they get better land for them to, for agriculture and so on, because by and large Tigray is a very arid land. So there isn't much of uh, agricultural activity. So they need these fertile lands. But the bigger and the long-term interest is to make sure that, that Tigray, if they were to become independent, that it would not be a landlocked country. That was Deacon Yosef Tafari. Rumors about Tigray wanting to secede are false, Dr. Waldo says. And there's evidence Wolkite belongs to Tigray. These people historically were under Tigray. How do we know? Because they are Tigrinya speakers. If they were under Amhara, they would have been Amharic speakers. 
Second, all the names of the places in that entire Walkite uh, including the part which is part of the Walkite uh, uh, under the Amhara, including that, the place names are Tigrinya names. But the former emperors, they had their own ways of dividing people to the extent of creating no uh, province which would be called Oromo. That was not mentioned at all. And then from Tigray, many places were taken away. Basra Amari is a former TPLF member, and he also echoed this version of history. The Wolkait region was given to Gona, but these are Tigrinya-speaking people, and they are originally Tigrayans. They might say something, but this is not true. These are all Tigrayans. And southern Tigray, there is a... Uh, a county like in the United States, Raya. They cut it and they uh, added it into the Wolo province, which is the Amhara area. And these are these were Tigrinya speaking people. So the uh, new constitution has to bring them back to where they belong. But for those that this constitution found them, although they were originally Tigrinya speaking, if they find them to be Amharic speaking, not speaking Tigrinya, they left them there. And then there were Afar, the Afar people was cut into four or five provinces. A major chant of their land and the people were with the ground. Since this new constitution has to give the right to the nation's, the nation's right, the Afar region has to go to the Afar people and Tigray has to lose it. So does in the Agro region, there was a chunk of uh, land and the people in Tigray, in, uh, in the southern, in Tembian area, there were Ago, and the majority Ago live in Wollo. Tigray has to live there, and they are added to Wollo. So, in terms of land, the region, I believe, Tigray has maybe lost more land than it gained. But it's not about land, it is about the right of people. If there is big contention, what you do is you do a referendum and let the people decide. Why should uh, it be a reason for fighting? Finally, the government said these committee members were the ones instigating the people to raise this question and then they came to arrest the committee members in Gonda. That turned actually to be uh, very violent. And uh, since then, Protests in different major cities and towns in Amhara regional states uh, spread. Some reports suggest members of the ruling Amhara party incited the protest. Protesters targeted Tigrayans in the attacks and held a flag that is banned by the Ethiopian government. The flag is used by Amhara opposition groups who oppose ethnic federalism. It's also used by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church in exile, whose members are mainly Amhara. The exiled church has played a key role in mobilizing Ethiopians against EPRDF and TPLF specifically. Here's some background on the church. When you think of the Orthodox faith and then the actual the country itself, they were kind of integrated in such a way that they felt in order for them to make a fundamental change in the way that they would govern the country, they needed to install um, a patriarch and delegitimize the uh, the Holy Synod that existed prior to that uh, and install uh, a, a person that is of their ethnic origin. And so they installed someone by pushing out the existing leadership. In fact, they were spared of their lives because they could have put them in, in jail and uh, or executed them. Uh, but instead, uh, they were able to uh, leave the country and went into exile and finally settled in North America. 
The patriarch of the exiled church is Abuna Makarios. There are conflicting reports about whether he was forced out of Ethiopia or chose to leave. The communist regime upset the leadership order when it came to power in 1974. Abuna Theophilus was the patriarch at the time. He was imprisoned for anointing bishops without the consent of the derg. The bishops he anointed were also imprisoned. Some years later, the derg ended up killing Abuna Theophilus and appointing new leadership to the church. This new leadership is what led to the appointment of Abuno Makarios as patriarch in 1988. When EPDRF came to power, Abuno Makarios was replaced by Abuno Paulos. Abuno Paulos was one of the bishops imprisoned under the derg and anointed by Abuno Theophilus. The patriarch Abuno Paulos happened to be from Tigray. He is a highly learned, educated person, uh, appropriate for the position. Unfortunately, because he comes from Tigray, that added to the fuel. There were uh, churches which subscribed to the Holy Synod in Ethiopia and other churches which subscribed to the Holy, uh, Holy Synod in exile. And then there were other churches that say a synod cannot be uh, in exile. So they, we agree that the Holy Synod is in exile, but we are not happy about the appointment of the uh, patriarch. So we, ha we remain independent. So the Ethiopian church, Orthodox churches in the diaspora were split not only into two, but into three. So initially it was just Amhara and Tigray churches. That was how they were called. But later on, it was Tigray against other ethnic groups. It was like that. Uh, so as time went by, some people don't care. They say that uh, they would go to uh, is a church without any restriction. Uh, they say that only administration is the main reason for the separation in terms of uh, dogmatic uh, and doctrinal uh, principles. There is no separation. Abuna Paulos died in 2012. The patriarch that replaced him is from Tigray. Dr. Weldu says people like him are interested in reconciliation between the two churches. But the split is so wide that a solution is hard to imagine. In fact, I sometimes say that uh, would there be any solution at all? There were only four uh, archbishops and when four of them die, that means there would be the end of ordaining priests in exile, so that would be the end. But the problem is they have already ordained archbishops and bishops and they will continue to do that. So if there is any kind of agreement between the synod in exile and in Ethiopia, I would say that it is really, really a miracle. In either case, there are other equally complex hurdles that would need to be tackled. Bumulkai and Raya Azebo are not the only areas where ethnic cleansing and genocidal acts have been committed against Amaras. We can cite in the areas of Beishangul, West and East RC, and Afar, between 1990 and 1994, close to 41,800 Amaras were killed and 70,000 Amaras were displaced from their homes. In the areas of Olega, in the year 2000, 1,200 Amaras were killed and 14,000 displaced from their homes. During this atrocity, children were thrown into fire and a four-year-old child was forced to drink the blood of her dead father. Hmm. In Benchmaji in 2015, 600 Amaras were killed and 22,000 Amaras were displaced from their homes. In West Shua, 500 Amaras were displaced in 2015. Since the Amara protest began in 2016, over 227, and these are government-provided numbers, have been killed, but we believe the numbers are much higher. This is just a small sample of the many atrocities committed against Amaras. As stated in the 2007 Ethiopian census that was released, the Amara population was short by 2.5 million. A debate was not even allowed in Parliament when this fact was presented. Some estimates have the number now closer to 5 million. We believe there has been a systematic effort by the government to depopulate the Amara population. Thus, the recent protest by Amaras was not about democracy or economics, but was simply about their identity, their land, and the need to survive as a people. Hundreds have been killed while peacefully protesting. Hundreds of homes burnt by security forces in retaliation against Amaras, and thousands imprisoned. We can never know the exact number killed, wounded, tortured, and arrested unless an independent and transparent investigation is conducted by an international body. When all these horrendous acts of genocide and ethnic cleansing were occurring, 
the world, including Ethiopian opposition groups, were silent. It is because of this silence. The Amara people had no other choice but to organize themselves, so they may have a voice. It is because of this silence and the basic need for survival, the Amara's farmers in Gondor and Gojam decided to wage an armed struggle. That was Tejo's Turfe. I wasn't able to independently verify the information in his testimony, but a high number of Amhara sought asylum in the U.S. after EPRDF came to power. The high numbers prompted the University of Minnesota's Human Rights Center to publish a report on the status of Amharas in Ethiopia. The report is well-researched and appears to be the most objective report on Ethiopia since EPRDF came to power. It was published in 1993, but it's almost identical to the situation in present-day Ethiopia. It cites numerous clashes between ethnic groups, the displacement of Amharas because of their minority status in certain regions, armed resistance in Gondor and Gojam, which are both in the Amhara region. A link to the report will be in the show notes, and it's worth reading. Deacon Yosef Tafari's brother was 14 years old when he was murdered by the Derg. He was one of many young people killed by the regime. Most Ethiopians agree that life under the Derg was one of the worst periods of Ethiopian history. But now some are saying that life under EPDRF is no better I left Ethiopia to save my life. Uh, the regime that that I was running away from, the communist military communist regime, finally fell, and these people took over. And I find them in so many levels that worse than, in fact, the, the communist regime. So I start to protest in opposition to them, which put me in a situation that my life is at risk for me to enter Ethiopia and peacefully visit my families and come back. Um, so as a result, I have not been fortunate enough to visit Ethiopia since I left. The Amharas were not happy about uh, the control of the state government by the TPLF-led EPRDF government. They were not happy about that. In fact, some of them were members of the military government. They just uh, took it as a defeat of the Amhara by the Tigrayans, you know. They just took it personally, that law. But Dr. Ezekiel Gabisa says Amharas are suffering. They take turns. Since 1991, the Tigrayans had taken the helm of power, captured the state machinery, and actually discriminated against Amhara a lot, even more, because these are the contenders for power. Did they ostracize the Amhara? Absolutely. And it is true that Amharas are protesting because they are excluded from exercising power in the center. But culturally, yeah, Amharas always want to equate Amhara being Amhara with being Ethiopian. They have not accepted an Amhara identity and they're not mobilized as Amhara. There is this ambivalence among the Amhara elite. Who should we be? We should be Ethiopians, they say, because Ethiopian means Amhara. So Amharas, because of domination, they are accepting their Amharaness. But they're ambivalent about accepting a lower level of identity. But that evolution had began under uh, TPLF rule, that they are actually now accepting their Amhara identity.